Last year, I revealed something that I had stumbled upon while researching European royal family trees. It was a hidden matrilineal dynasty that no one ever talks about, but which directly connects most of the biggest names in European history. Names such as Louis XIV, Catherine the Great, Queen Victoria, and Kaiser Wilhelm II. All four of these monarchs, as well as dozens of other European kings, queens, and emperors, can be traced via their female-only lines to a single common ancestor, a French countess who lived 800 years ago, and whose name was Garcenda. I therefore named this hidden but highly influential matrilineal dynasty the House of Garcenda which got me and I think many others thinking. Maybe there were other major matrilineal dynasties hiding behind the scenes within European history. So I went looking to see what I could find, and I was not disappointed. In addition to the House of Garcenda, I found six more matrilineal dynasties that I felt were large enough to be considered major dynasties. Now, none of these six are as large or as important as the House of Garcenda, but they are all quite interesting in their own right. So today, I'm going to show you two more matrilineal dynasties. I'm going to show you the House of Eleanor of Aquitaine and the House of Euphrosyne of Constantinople. The two dynasties we are going to look at today both began around the same time during the High Middle Ages. However, one originated in Western Europe and the other in Eastern Europe. Let's look at the Western one first. It starts with Eleanor of Aquitaine, one of the most important women in all of European history. In addition to being the Duchess of Aquitaine in her own right, she was also the only woman to become both Queen of France and Queen of England, although not at the same time. First, she was Queen Consort of France through her marriage to Louis VII. As Queen of France, she traveled with Louis to the Holy Land to participate in the Second Crusade. But their relationship was never quite the same after that trip, and eventually the marriage was annulled. However, she did bear him two children during their time together, both daughters. One of those daughters, named Marie, had a daughter, also named Marie, who became an empress. In fact, Marie was the first ever empress consort of the crusader state commonly known as the Latin Empire. But it was Eleanor's second marriage to a young duke named Henry that turned out to be the more important one. When they married, England was in the middle of a civil war, and Henry was fighting against his cousin Stephen for control of the country. Luckily for her, Eleanor chose the winning side, and just two years after the marriage, she became a queen consort again, this time of England. It also meant that her territory, Aquitaine, was now under the control of England instead of France. Together, Henry and Eleanor had five sons and three daughters. Two of her sons went on to become kings of England. First, Richard the Lionheart, and then second, King John. But remember, we are tracing a matrilineal dynasty in this video. And matrilineal dynasties can only continue through females. That's why the female lines are shown solid and the male lines are shown dotted. So let's focus on the daughters. Eleanor of Aquitaine's daughter Matilda married Henry the Lion, Duke of Saxony, and their son went on to become Holy Roman Emperor as Otto IV. So although patrilineally Otto IV was from the House of Welf, matrilineally he was from the House of Eleanor. Eleanor's daughter Joan married the King of Sicily and thus became Queen of Sicily. But it was through Eleanor of Aquitaine's daughter Eleanor, I guess we could call her Eleanor Jr., that this dynasty continued to a third and fourth generation. 
Eleanor Jr. married Alfonso VIII, King of Castile. Their only son, Henry I, became King of Castile after his father's death. However, he died at age 13, at which time his eldest sister, Berengaria, became Queen Regnant of Castile for a brief period before turning the throne over to her son, Ferdinand III. You can see that Berengaria also had a daughter who shared her name, who went on to become the second person in this dynasty to hold the title Empress Consort of the Latin Empire. But Eleanor Jr. also had three other daughters, all of whom became queen consorts. Uraca became queen of Portugal and had two sons who reigned as kings of Portugal. Eleanor, who we might call Eleanor III, became queen of Aragon, but that marriage was later annulled and she became a nun. And then there was Blanche, who married King Louis VIII of France, and thus became Queen Consort of France, like her grandmother before her. It is because of this marriage that Eleanor of Aquitaine's bloodline enters that of the French monarchy. Remember, Eleanor of Aquitaine did not actually produce an heir while she was Queen Consort of France. Therefore, her former husband, Louis VII, married for a second time to Adela of Champagne. It was Louis VII's grandson, through that marriage, that married Eleanor of Aquitaine's granddaughter, producing the only king of France to be granted sainthood, Saint Louis IX. In fact, his sister Isabel was granted sainthood as well, and his brother Charles became king of Sicily. Interestingly, both Louis IX of France and Charles I of Sicily married granddaughters of Garcenda. In fact, two of Garcenda's other granddaughters married descendants of Eleanor of Aquitaine as well, Henry III of England and Richard of Cornwall, who was elected King of Germany. But note that these four sisters, although they were the granddaughters of Garcenda, do not actually belong to the matrilineal house of Garcenda. This is because they were the children of a son of Garcenda, not a daughter. Remember, matrilineal dynasties only continue through female lines. It is at this point that the house of Eleanor comes to an end. But within these four generations, her matrilineal descendants included eight kings, seven queens, two empresses, and two saints. Of course, Eleanor of Aquitaine had many more royal descendants beyond this. It's just that those descendants don't come from female-only lines. For example, through St. Louis IX, Eleanor was an ancestor of Blanche I of Navarre, and thus most of the House of Garcenda as well. And through Afonso II of Portugal, she was an ancestor of a woman named Isabel of Barcelos, who ended up establishing a matrilineal dynasty of her own, which we'll look at another day. But for now, I want to turn your attention to another matrilineal dynasty that was contemporaneous with Eleanor of Aquitaine's, which I have called the House of Euphrosyne. Euphrosyne was an empress consort of the Byzantine Empire through her marriage to Alexius III. It is through her that links can be made between the Eastern Roman Empire and almost every monarch in modern European history. But of course, in this video, we are only going to look at her matrilineal descendants. And these include 12 kings, 6 queens, 1 emperor, 3 empresses, and to saints. Definitely enough to deserve being called a major matrilineal dynasty. Unfortunately for her, Euphrosyne was Byzantine empress at the time when Constantinople was attacked by the Latin Crusaders. After she and her husband fled the city, her daughter Eudokia briefly became Byzantine empress as well. She had previously been married to the first king of Serbia and was the mother of the second and third Serbian kings. 
after Constantinople fell to the Latin Crusaders, a rump state called the Empire of Nicaea was formed, and one of Euphrosyne's other daughters, named Anna, became empress there. But before we look at her descendants, I should point out that another one of Euphrosyne's daughters, Irene, was the maternal grandmother of Michael VIII, Paleologos. Michael was the Byzantine emperor who captured Constantinople back from the Crusaders and established the final Byzantine dynasty there. He also had a niece who became Empress of Bulgaria, twice. But now let's return to Anna, Empress of Nicaea. One of her daughters, Irene, became Empress of Nicaea as well and Irene's son reigned as emperor of Nicaea. But it is through Anna's daughter Maria that the dynasty really took off. Maria married Bela IV of Hungary, one of the most important kings in the history of that country. They had many children, including Stephen V, who became the next king of Hungary, but they also had many daughters. Two of those daughters became saints, Saint Margaret of Hungary and Saint Kinga of Poland. Kinga is considered a Polish saint because she married the High Duke of Poland. However, they both took a vow of chastity. There was also Elizabeth, who married the Duke of Bavaria. Their son went on to become another king of Hungary. And Anna, who married a Rurikid prince. Her daughter married the king of Bohemia, and their son went on to become king there, as Wenceslaus II. We'll return to him in a moment, but let's first look at the descendants of Yolanda of Poland. She was beatified, which is a step towards becoming a saint, but so far she has not received full sainthood, like her sisters. She was the mother of Jadwiga, who became queen consort of Poland. Jadwiga was, in turn, the mother of Kazimir III, the last Piast king of Poland, and the one who is known as Kazimir the Great. After the death of Kazimir the Great, the throne of Poland was briefly united with the throne of Hungary. This is because Kazimir's sister had married the king of Hungary, and therefore their son, Louis I, eventually inherited both the thrones of Hungary as well as Poland. We're going to come back to him, but first, let's trace another line from Yolanda of Poland. One of her great-granddaughters from a female-only line, named Elizabeth, became queen consort of Sicily. She gave birth to two future kings of Sicily, as well as Beatrice, who mothered a king of Germany, and Eleanor, who became queen consort of Aragon. Eleanor was the mother of two Aragonese kings, as well as a daughter, also named Eleanor, who became queen consort of Castile. Because that queen's brothers did not produce any heirs for Aragon, the throne of Aragon passed to her second-born son, Ferdinand, whereas the throne of Castile passed to her first-born son, Henry. It is at this point that the matrilineal house of Euphrosyne comes to an end. However, you can see that there's a connection to the house of Isabel, which I mentioned earlier, through Henry, as well as a connection to the house of Garcenda, through Ferdinand. Let's now return to Wenceslaus II of Bohemia and Louis I of Hungary and Poland. Wenceslaus had a grandson who became Holy Roman Emperor as Charles IV. He's shown in grey because he does not belong to any of the matrilineal dynasties on this chart. His son Sigismund went on to become Holy Roman Emperor as well. However, it's Sigismund's wife that I'd like to point out. Her name was Barbara, and she's the progenitor of another major matrilineal dynasty, which I've labeled the House of Barbara. I'll do a video on that house another day, but for now, I'll tell you that it is the second largest matrilineal dynasty in Europe, after the Gersendians. 
But the House of Euphrosyne connects to the House of Barbara in another way as well. Louis I of Hungary and Poland had a daughter named Jadwiga, who became the King of Poland. That's right, a daughter who became king. One of the few females in history who were technically given the title of king. She was the mother of King Casimir IV of Poland, who married a member of the House of Barbara. Again, we'll take a look at their many famous matrilineal descendants another day. But for now, that wraps up a look at the House of Eleanor of Aquitaine and Euphrosyne of Constantinople. I will point out that I do eventually plan to offer a complete chart of the seven matrilineal dynasties of Europe as a poster. However, the full chart is not quite done yet, so if that's of interest to you, make sure you subscribe and or stay tuned so that you can be notified when it's ready. Thanks for watching.